Welcome to the final chapter of Celestial Horizons Shattered Sleep, an interactive podcast where listeners have influenced how the story developed. Shattered Sleep, our first season of Celestial Horizons, ends with this episode. However, the story of the Arc La Rivea will continue in a standalone podcast drama, releasing next week on September 4th, 2021, exploring some of the long-term consequences of what has happened here on the Arc La Rivea. This episode will be called Infinite Silence. A few short weeks after that, a second season will begin, titled Dissident Echoes, and will be set in the solar system Kepler-62 after the Ark arrives. Dissident Echoes will contain multiple new modes of interaction, for both people who want more impactful ways to get involved, and for people who want a more casual experience. Follow us on your favorite social media site for more information about these projects. Alarms deactivated. Redundancy networks restored. Systems at 82% functionality. After Hollis Saberhagen and the rest of the engineering team successfully broke up the conflict between both the dissenters and Captain Aoman, the remaining members of the crew opted, in tandem with the captain, to wait approximately five years for a resupply delivery of cryojuice from Earth. Earth has built a special vessel known as Kikmir and loaded it up with extra cryofluid and spare parts. They will be attempting to send it to the Ark La Rivea by means of the same experimental wormhole system that sent the Ark to Kepler-62 in the first place. However, due to the complexities and challenges of unanchored wormhole generation, there is only a 4.5% chance that Keepmere will arrive close enough for the crew to retrieve it. Otherwise, it will appear somewhere too far away to reach in the lifetime of those currently awake. Knowing that the chances are slim, the crew has stabilized most of their systems in the five years they've been waiting for the delivery. And now, they wait with bated breath as they watch for Keetmir and hope that it is close enough to save them. Welcome to ArcNet. I am Anna, the ArcNet Navigational Assistant. Today's Earth date is January 18th, 2378. For your information, in approximately 30 minutes, Earth will be opening a wormhole and sending the Keetmir resupply vessel through. I will relay real-time updates from the bridge. We are T-minus 15 seconds to wormhole activation. <clears throat> Are we ready, people? Mission Control, we're standing by. T minus five, four, three, two, one. Package is on route. The entire ship waits with bated breath while the sensor slowly begins to search the sky for any sign of Ketmir. It could take weeks to find. No sign of anomalies in Sector 1, sir. No sign in Sector 2. Nothing in Sector 3. With every agonizing day, the likeliness of a successful delivery decreases. Every day that passes amounts to years of travel time to possibly pick up the resupply. No sign in Sector 6, sir. Uh, nothing in Sector 7. Nothing in Sector 8. Did they miss it? Did something happen to it? Or is it just so far away that its light hasn't had time to reach their eyes yet? Nothing in 11, or 12. We're starting a second pass. Throughout the entire vessel, there are 251 individuals counting on this. Without it, 219 will never see home again. Nothing on the second pass, sir. We are searching again. You have to wait just over 39 days until you find it. I've got something, sir. I I'm detecting the anomaly. How far out is it? Come take a look, sir. Anna, put me through to the crew. Affirmative. Attention all crew. For those of you who haven't been listening in real time, we have successfully located Kitmir. 
I am sorry to inform you that it is approximately 526 AU away from our current location, which amounts to 210 years of travel. This means that we will not be getting a resupply of the Sculpin Antifreeze Protein Solution, nor the spare parts we have been hoping for. As such, we will chart a course and immediately begin our acceleration towards Apatia. Tomorrow at 1300 hours, those of us who will remain will gather together to elect officials for the Hypatia Commission. As we have discussed, these commissioners will work alongside GNA officials to oversee the social and civic development of the Ark for the duration of our journey and, indeed, our lives. We will vote on three commissioners. More information will be available through ARCnet. It has been a pleasure working with you all these last five years. The entire sleeping crew owes us a great debt. Please be there for each other as we share in this great disappointment. Take your time to grieve, then be prepared to face the future as we continue the great mission we have embarked upon. End of transmission. Final message, a shipwide broadcast from myself. Attention all crew. We will now begin with the drawing for the nine available doses of the cryofluid. Mission Command wishes to thank and honor each of you who have volunteered for your noble hearts and willingness to sacrifice for the good of others. Using random numbers generated from analysis of cosmic background radiation, the following nine individuals have been selected to receive one of the nine doses of cryofluid. Quill and Dara. Emmett Lair, Tyrion Flox Hillgoth Drake, Lishara Valencia Hernandez Pizarro, Metodilla Cledwin McCreary, Angelina Nokimi, Diocletian N. Schutman, Isaias Eugenio Valdez. Congratulations! If your name was just called, Please report to medical at your earliest convenience to re-enter cryosleep. We would now like to take this moment to honor the 2,993 individuals we lost in the events following our trip through the wormhole. Abdelmajid Azara Erdin O'Loughlin Alexandra Hyonju Alima Yates Andre Cash. Aoife Crawford. My name is Anatolio Armando Elwood. Gutierrez. I tried to take a stand against Armando injustice and elitism. Arcanafe. A stand for the rights of all of the crew to have a say in how they were going to die. But that ideal was spit upon and stamped out. And then everything that I warned them about came true. There was no resupply, and most of what little we had was given to the favorites of those in power. I was brigged, stood lawful trial, and was convicted of charges of mutiny, conspiracy, attempted murder, and terrorism. Not only was I exempted from consideration for the cryofluid, but my pay was stripped from me, and my dignity crushed. I spent 29 years locked up in various accommodations, until Captain Aoman died of old age. Their successor granted this miserable old man a pardon, allowing me to go and live out the rest of my life among the people on the ship. I was nearly 60 by then, surrounded by the adult children of those that stood with me in the communications room. Everywhere I went, they whispered about the man who almost destroyed the mission. They got it wrong. I was the fall guy, the one selected to pay the price for what many of us did. Their parents stood with me made demands, fired the guns, rigged the explosives. But they were cowards and sellouts, and only I had to pay the price for taking a stand, and I paid with almost three decades of my life. But by the time I was freed, there was nothing to be done about it. History had made up its mind about me, though, as the children of the Ark had children of their own, some of them dared to talk to me, to ask if the stories about the terrorists and mutineers were true. 
don't forget us, I told them. We fought for justice, for transparency, and the captain trampled on all of that. Those in power don't care about people like you or people like me, and they're not afraid to kill to make you comply. So don't forget us. I died of natural causes when I was 81, with an unfinished pile of writings on liberty and respect and justice on the table next to me. They contained my regrets about what had happened, but also my convictions to the ideals I stood for that day. I had revised them obsessively countless times, but never arrived at anything I was satisfied with. Castro, Calic O'Loughlin, Carmina Sig Acting Captain Zachary Aylman, made captain officially once the resupply failed and it was determined that nobody else was to be woken up. Mission Control back at Earth commended both our handling of the situation and the new Hypatia Commission that we had set up. Over the next two decades, we found a nice rhythm as we crawled through space and time. Some of the living crew members were allowed to wake up their families, and our population grew and then shrunk as the years passed on. We saw marriages. We saw deaths. A tiny community of around 300 inhabiting a vessel the size of Manhattan. In addition to finalizing repairs as much as possible, I supported the crew in using a piece of damaged hull from B-Ring to create a mobile monument, etching all the names of the people who had died in their journey through the wormhole. To scratch their names in something solid, to have them be remembered in a form other than a string of code on a server on some 200 level deck, I suppose one trick to leadership is knowing when to allow people to engage in purely sentimental activities even if they're nothing but a drain of time and energy. At the top of the monument, in the biggest letters, was etched the name Giovanna Stravinsky, the engine specialist killed in the crossfire on that day in the communications room. Alicia Higgins, Ernest Rook Karmas. I allowed them to place the monument in the main mess hall as a frequent reminder of the sacrifices that were made to get the mission this far. Someone wrote an anthem, a line of which was included at the base of the monument. The journey is long and the pathway is hard, but such is the road that will lead to the stars. I didn't like the monument. It took up space and was an unsightly hunk of metal, so seeing it at every meal quickly became rather agitating. But still, I allowed it to be kept. Leadership is knowing when to let your people do what they want to do. I worked long hours, day in and day out, running an efficient ship. I selected those of the new generation who would lead the mission the rest of the way to Hypatia, and when my body began to fail, instructed the medical teams not to try and keep me alive. I died in the command chair, as I was working late, writing reports for Mission Command one evening at the age of 74. Jael Holzer, Jada Haynes, Jonathan Medina, Joshua Hi. Ragnar. I'm Anthony Worthing, former Dunn. Assistant Deputy Chief of Engineering. They didn't bring any charges against me, even though I was involved in the uh, unrest, because I helped end it all. I, I, I guess I, <laughs> I was demoted about as far as it was possible to be demoted. But I didn't have to do any brig time, so that was good. I spent a long time cleaning up waste management. That was not good. (laughs) It was my idea to celebrate Juice Day every year. On January 18th, the anniversary of the failed supply drop. We'd celebrate by drinking, well, juice, fruit, vegetable, whatever, and, and toast to the fact that we were unlucky and didn't get any cryo juice and to the new little community and family we made instead. I mean, if we had gone back to sleep, I wouldn't have met Janice, a mechanical engineer on the A-Shift, and we wouldn't have had our son, who we named Hollis. We ran out of the solid rations we were allowed to eat after only eight months. But aside from just the reality of really missing real meat and potatoes the rest of my life, living on the Ark wasn't that bad. With some of the 90% of the populations are engineers with nothing better to do, there was always something to keep us entertained. We made up holidays, built all sorts of crazy contraptions, and 
And when the kids got older, we'd do reenactments of things they'd never get to know from back home. We had dances in the mess hall and, and simulated catching fireflies in one of the cargo bays. Ooh, we invented new instruments out of scrap metal and hung up art on the bulkheads. But my favorite thing to do was to take little Hollis to the porthole window on the same deck as our quarters and just sit with him, looking at all of the little pinpricks of light. It was always just a little scary, thinking about how big everything was or how small we were. But it was kind of exciting, too. My son kept up the tradition long after I was gone of staring out into the porthole to remind himself of just where he fit in and everything. I think my favorite part of that little song that somebody wrote was the line that goes, Though silence surrounds us, we are not afraid. With shadows abounding, a new home we've made. Even though we haven't gotten to Hypatia yet, we've already made a home here in this little tin can. I died at the age of 75, a few hours after Janice did, holding my son's hand as he held his daughter in his arms. All three of us looking out of the porthole one last time. Kirby Logan, Kolog Indris, Layla May Wong, Leonius Annalise Kumpana, My name is Hollis Saberhagen. Lily Grace Dean. As soon as the ship could officially be declared safe, I resigned as acting engineering chief. Lishar Hernandez, my deputy chief, somehow looked out enough to get drawn to go back to sleep. Worthing had been demoted, so the responsibility for the engineering department was passed on to an entirely new team. I was nominated for the Hypatia Commission, and was the first choice by a wide margin. But I turned it down. I knew I wouldn't be able to handle it. I could keep myself together through a short crisis because of the importance of what we were doing, but long-term... Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's not true. Maybe... Maybe I just didn't want to handle it. Part of me felt resentful, I guess. Angry, even. That they would ask any more of me. The rest of my, my life was filled with stress-induced nightmares, Lynch. with the ringing sound Marcus of gunshots Walter. and the pleading eyes of Megan the people Copeland. who wanted me to Mia fix Lowry. it, who who saw me as Nazifa their last hope Solomon. to be saved, and I never could. I had Pedro given them Francis. everything. I had given them my Regina sanity, Fee. my energy, my Rona skills. Derek. I had given them my Rodrigo life. I. Calderon. I kept my name on the volunteer list, even when I wanted nothing more than to just have a chance to be with my husband, Thomas. To go back to sleep. To rest in peaceful oblivion and wake when this journey was over and be able to tell him all about what happened. But... He was essential personnel for gate operations, so... Not to be woken up until we were ready to go back to Earth. Under no circumstances would I have been permitted to unfreeze him. He was too important for the Riking mission. No. <laughs> the only way I could have seen him again was to try and get one of those nine doses of cryofluid. But I was a leader of sorts. People were looking to me. I asked them to risk their lives to protect Spook and end the hostilities. I, I spoke over and over again about the good of the mission, about putting the rest of the crew before your own selfish interests. I mean, <laughs> how could I have ever looked any of those people in the eye if I had scrambled to avoid everything, to avoid the difficulties that we were all about to face? If I had tried to claim what little hope they had for myself? to personally reap the benefits of our actions. So, I kept my name on the volunteer list and let my chance slip away. I didn't complain, not once. Most people were going through the same thing anyway, losing loved ones, giving up on dreams. I had to be strong for the rest of the crew. They looked up to me, 
spoke of me like I was a legend, telling their kids of the classical hero that saved the ship from certain doom. <laughs> Everybody was my friend, but I couldn't be myself with all of my weakness and exhaustions and vulnerabilities. It was alienating. Isolating. In the years that followed, I sometimes found myself with a blanket around my shoulders, curled up on the floor near his cryopod, replaying the last memories of the goodnight kiss and the see you soon we exchanged before going under all those years ago. I kept recording and writing messages for him, entitled the collection, <laughs> Dear Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> I chronicled life on the Ark, the tears, the laughter, the mundane. I wrote poems and stories, and my innermost thoughts all addressed to the one person who I felt had always seen me as I was. It gave me some peace in the long years that followed. I eventually would teach engineering courses to the kids that were born on the Ark. <laughs> that gave me a sense of purpose again, I, I suppose. It made me feel a little bit like a mother, even though I never had kids of my own. Oh, what is this price that we have paid? Is this the requirement of being an explorer, a leader, a pioneer? Is this the toll exacted from every honest person who finds themselves in times of crisis? Or is this the hand of fate, picking a number of us to pay the price for reaching toward the stars, so that one day our posterity could live among them? I died at the age of 67, alone, while strapped to all sorts of equipment in a medical bay. Sonia Chavez Mendoza, Sunny Parker, Sorja Walls, Ulicar Galdin, Vespera Henderson, Victor Aloysius Zesfin, Wilfred Mendez, Xylan Rye, Zant Frosthaven, Thank you for joining us in this moment of remembrance. The Hymn to Hypatia, written from bits and pieces of Saberhagen's message to the dissenters on that day in the communications room, goes like this. As children of Terra, with resolute mind, we reach to the stars and leave our world behind. Mission Control wishes you a happy juice day and wants to honor those who volunteered to remain awake for the rest of this journey. We will arrive at Hypatia in 70 years. Though silence surrounds us, we are not afraid. With shadows abounding, a new home we've made. Mission Control wishes you a happy juice day and wants to honor your parents who gave of their lives so that the mission could continue. We will arrive at Hypatia in 41 years. The journey is long, and the pathway is hard, but such is the road that will lead to the stars. Mission Control wishes you a happy juice day and wants to honor your grandparents who spent their lives preparing you for the mission. We will arrive at Hypatia in 13 years. Our heritage grand, our horizons bright. We'll vanquish the shadows and build realms of light. End of message. Good luck, and Godspeed. Thank you for listening to the eighth and final chapter of Celestial Horizons Shattered Sleep. As previously announced, a week from today, a standalone episode titled Infinite Silence will be released, set near the end of the Arc Lyravea's journey to the Hypatia solar system. A few weeks after that, our second season titled Dissonant Echoes will begin. For the latest Celestial Horizons news and content releases, please visit our website at celestialhorizons.io. This episode features Els Buckley as Captain Aoman, Orion Howard as Anna, 
Olivia Oki as Hollis Saberhagen, Chris Rollins as Anthony Worthing, Eric Ridding as Anatolio Elwood, and myself, Nathan Young, as the narrator. This episode was written by Riley Jeffs and Nathan Young, with music by Marcus Richardson and Nathan Young. Good luck, and Godspeed. <laughs>